up, Woody Nerdigans? This is the one and only Packer Girl 89, and today's book nerdigan discussion is going to be on Armageddon by Thomas E. Sinigowski, and this is the final book in the Fallen series, and, you have, and if you have not read The Fallen, Leviathan, Airy, Reckoning, End of Days, Forsaken, or Armageddon, or have not watched any of the videos that I have done for the previous books, go read the books! Then go watch the videos, which I have made a playlist for, so you should be able to find them pretty easily. And then come back so we can talk about them. And um, I have to, before I continue, I have to apologize to Tom because, Tom, I'm so sorry that it's been taking me so long to do this video. It's just that if you, um, based on my wall, you can tell that I've been really busy. Um, I've been actually expanding my business. Uh, I've been catching up. I've been. I haven't been. I've been bad on the book nerdigan front. There should. I should be doing a lot more book nerdigan stuff, but I. I haven't been. I've been expanding other parts of my business at the moment. So that's that's kind of why I haven't done a lot of book nerdigan stuff. But um, I am. I haven't been reading as many books as I should either. I'm so behind on books, but I'm going to get back on track. To I figured I gotta at least catch up on my videos. And yes, this is part of the hashtag in readathon. I'm uh, really close. I have, uh, um, oh my gosh. I have The Immortal City and I have, um, I'm working on Natural Born Angel because I get to read my books at work. So I get to, so that's when I'm working on my book Nerdigan stuff because I have a lot of crap going on. But yeah, so yeah, Tom, I'm really sorry for that, and that's what's been going on with Book Nerdigans. But here's the beautiful cover of Armageddon. And yes, let's get to this. Anything that's mentioned in this Book Nerdigan discussion video is probably gonna be mentioned in my Book Nerdigan rant on Battle Angel. And I got a feeling, cause based on what I've been reading in Natural Born Angel, that's gonna end up being a rant too. Because some of the political logic in that book is just really fucking, is just fucked up, but that's a whole different thing. We'll get there. We'll get there with Natural Born Angel. But anyway, let's get to this. So, we, in the pre, in the, um, in the prologue, um, it, we're back at Vilma, we're back at Vilma's house, and Aaron is still hurt from, uh, his battle, the battle with the Dark Star, and, um, and basically, Taylor, um, Taylor, who's Aaron's mother, and she's still alive, um, basically comes and takes, uh, Aaron and, um, and Taylor to their, uh, to where she's at, at their base, with the Unforgiven. And who the Unforgiven are, are the fallen angels, um, have refused forgiveness for the crimes they had committed against heaven during the Great War. And denied all divine abilities, the Unforgiven mastered magically enhanced technology to carry out their mission against the architects as a way of penance for their crimes and finally allow themselves to be forgiven. And I'm going to definitely be mentioning the magically enhanced technology in, in the especially in Natural Born Angel and um, and definitely in Battle Angel. Trust me, it's going to be mentioned again. It, it will be. So basically, uh, Taylor and the Unforgiven uh, brought Aaron and Vilma to an um, abandoned underground missile base. So Levy, who's one of the Unforgiven, had explained that the ever uh, the Unforgiven claimed places that were abandoned. So it's very similar to how um, the Neffel or the uh, Nephilim, I just, God, uh, sweet, the Sweet Evil series got me saying Nephil a lot. Um, it's like how the Nephil uh, were claiming um, different spots for the Airy and a lot of the other fallen angels too. They were abandoned places. And uh, this included desecrated churches, burned out buildings. So this, um, oh, the, uh, yeah, the, um, the consecrated churches, there we go. Burned out buildings, unfinished construction, and decommissioned military bases, and they became their secret hideouts. And this particular base in Kansas had been abandoned since the late 80s. So, 
there's a healing ring that what what it does is Taylor pulled a Aaron Sheets down to his waist and revealed a copper colored ring with a glass center po uh, pulsing on his chest with an unearthly energy, and that seems to mirror the beat of her boy of uh, Aaron's heart. So Taylor explains that it's an unforgiven design, and it's an it's a machine that uses stray life energies to boost uh, the healing potential of the individual of the individual. And I, I gotta say, one of my favorite parts of this book, in particular, I love the adventures of, um, of Malice and, uh, oh my gosh. I love, I love Malice. I grow, you grow to love Malice in this book. Malice is fucking awesome. I love the Malice chapters. So, um, so we meet the Yetis and... And I thought one of the funniest names for the Yetis was the Skunk Apes. Like, what? that is so random. How are they called Skunk Apes? Like, how? I, I don't know. Like, the Abominable Snowman, okay. Snow, uh, Bigfoots, sure. But Skunk Apes, what? Um, and the Malachi, and the, yeah, Malachi, which is Malice, um, uh, no, wait, it's not Malice, it's someone, else. oh my god, I can't think of it, hold on, it's gonna bug me. Yeah, it's the, it took me a second to remember, it's the Avengers of Malice and Tarshish. I love those chapters, because Tarshish is so freaking hilarious. Um, but yeah, Malice always called them Yetis. But yeah, um, so... Th these chapters are freaking crazy, but anyway, uh, the um, let's see, but the pow the powers they have are freaking crazy. The Malakim, the Malakim's powers, because the Malakim uh, Tarshish, he raised a hand, passing it through the air as if stirring bath water, and the remaining Yetis evaporated into a cloud, raining a coppery mist onto the already gore-covered floor. Like, how does anyone have that kind of power? It's just, oh my gosh. Uh, let's see. Now we get to something interesting here. So his eyes trickle down the pale skin. This is Virchiel. Um, Virchiel's eyes trickle down to the pale skin of his forearm and the strange snake-like mark that had appeared there. The three hooded sisters who spoke for their masters, the architects, had given him that mark, given him the mark. Yes, the three sisters, the ones that are supposedly, who are supposedly working for the Dark Star, work for the architects. That's how corrupt they are. They'd once told him, um, once told Fertil that once he made his decision, they would know and would call for him. But Fertil also had another choice to make, a choice that an ancient prophet had foretold in a painting. A decision um, would have repercussions on his future, the future of the world, and the future of heaven. You would think that would be it. Choosing to join the architects or not would be that cut, that decision, but I guess not. Um... And then Cameron, I thought Cameron's story was interesting. So Cameron discovered in his memories uh, at the cabin he was hiding out at um, that that um, his father left him something to help fight the architects in the cabin that he was at, which I thought was really cool. And I swear to Kami, Inosh is totally Stewie. He is. Like, every time I hear, I every time I was reading his POVs and... Every time he was just speaking, I read it in Stewie's voice. Anosh is just totally Stewie, period. And apparently we find out the Dark Star can breathe in space, and I'm just like, thank God. Okay, this is, uh, this is interesting. The Dark Star can breathe in space. If the Dark Star can breathe in space, you would think the Dark, like, uh, uh, does this mean other demons can breathe in space, or is it just him? But remember... Uh, that means, uh, keep in mind, the Dark Star is possessing Lucifer, Lucifer's body. So this means Lucifer can breathe in space. Does this mean all angels can breathe in space? Because we know that, um, uh, I think it was the last book that this happened. No, a couple books ago. We know that Wormwood can breathe in space. So this begs the question, can all angels breathe in space? I'm curious if they can. 
Tom, answer that for me. Can they all angels breathe in space? But now we're getting to the overseer here. So the overseer was the first to have been birthed by God, standing at the right side of the Almighty, as his 11 architect brothers were brought to, into existence. The overseer and the other architects were the personification of the Lord's vision for a world in the throes of birth. They were to oversee its creation, helping to bring the creator's vision for this wonder, wondrous place to fruition. And when that job was done, there uh, they were to be no more. But the overseer looked upon the world and saw not perfection, but chaos, and knew that the architect's job was far from complete. And it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be until the earth was like unto heaven, a new paradise. And the Lord God had moved um, onto some other great uh, grand scheme pertaining to the creation of all things, carelessly leaving behind some minor spark of thought, some flame of inspiration that um, that took hold of the moment and shaped it itself into an idea, and then a purpose. The overseer was that idea, and thus lived again, and saw with even more clarity. But it must do um, what it must do to fulfill his beloved master's aspirations of uh, perfection. But as the nothingness rose to greet him, the morning stars, um, the morning star recollected a long suppressed memory, the memory of his, uh, now we're going back to Lucifer, but uh, I just totally read a little far ahead in my notes. But it's interesting with the overseer, like if it wasn't for God, God just totally forgot about the overseer because of that teeny little thought, he, the overseer survived. Go figure, right? But now let's get back to Lucifer here. So, but as um, the nothingness rose up to greet him, because remember, Lucifer is about to like just be like go into the darkness of his memories and just die there basically in the subconsciousness. Uh, but as the nothingness rose up to greet him, the morning star recollected a long suppressed memory, the memory of his creation. He had sprung from nothing to kneel in the Lord's hand. And I shall call you the sun of the morning, God had said, and the morning star had become filled with the light and love of his creator. Which I thought was interesting. I like when we get this kind of stuff, when we see how God created angels and out of, and God created angels out of nothing, which is pretty badass. And Dusty is really Dusty is so cool. Like Dusty and the sword became one, literally. Like they were the sharp note was just becoming a part of him. And freaking Gabriel's like, what the hell is going on? It was so crazy. But now we're going to get back to Taylor here. So the angel's name is Adoriel. It was once his purpose to maintain the world's connection to heaven. As small as it is, he's somehow ma managed to keep the most fragile of links open. He's straining to keep that link open. It's killing him. Then our final, connect um, then our final connection to heaven will be severed. Uh, um, severed. So basically, if Adoriel dies, then yeah, they can't get in contact with heaven. So we thought that uh, Wormwood cut off their connection to heaven completely, but there's still a little hope. There still is a little hope. And I guess we would truly be on our own. And Laura Lee isn't dead completely. She's a ghost because we thought Laura Lee was completely killed by um, Darkstar in the, la in the last book. And Laura Lee ran into a hash and we had a really touching moment. And, oh, so many feels. And uh, Lahash said... Uh, guide them to the place, Laura Lee. Uh, let's see. They're the, uh, they're the last chance we have. Lead them. Lead them to the ladder where the last words that, you know, Laura Lee, uh, Lahash, Laura Lee heard Lahash uh, say. And somehow Laura Lee sensed that the beast could not perceive her ghostly shape, but it did not stop her from acting out in revulsion. And she found, this was so cool. When she, this was the dragon because she went back. She was back on Earth. She found herself reaching out to the creature's chitinous head and watching as her ghostly fingers passed into one of its bulging compa um, compound eyes. And her hand inside its head, she watched, uh, watched the... Um, Oh wait, she willed the monster to die, and the insect screeched one final time before its head exploded. That was so freaking cool when she did that. I was just like, damn, that was so cool. And now we get the angels of the void. Um, because remember, Lucifer took the dead Nephil and transformed them. So their bodies were now oily black as the dark star's blood and the surface of their skin reflecting the chamber's light with an unearthly shine. And their eyes glowed sickly yellow and their mouths which were twisted in a rictus grin of pain were, were filled with jagged razor sharp teeth. 
and Satan's new army crawled on all fours and their muscular blacks, um, muscular backs bucking wildly with their transformation. One after the other, they tossed their heads back, crying out in a strange combination of agony and relief as huge bat-like wings tore um, through their fabric of uh, through the fabric of their fresh or flesh. And then now we're getting now we're getting back to the adventures of uh, Tarshish and uh, um, and Malice. I just again I love Tarshish. He slowly became my favorite character in this book. I love him. He's just so funny. He um he said this. How did somebody so smart uh, fall for all the crap the Morning Star was shoveling during the war? I don't know why don't you tell, and then Malice said, I don't know, why don't you tell me, and they both had a good laugh. I was just like, that's just, I thought that show was hella funny. And then, and oh, then we get to Anosh here. Where are you going, Anosh, demanded Pet Petnuli. I haven't finished venting yet. I, see, this is a Stewie moment. And Jeremy walked uh, toward the door, a sword of fire igniting it, um, his grab, the grass. You have if you, um... You have if you don't want to be eaten by a sea serpent. And that shut up the wailing child. Ah, I love that part too. That shit was so funny. That just reminded me of a Brian Stewie moment. Oh, okay. Now we're in Aaron's POV. So Aaron, like, is subconsciously in his own little world. And it's really interesting how it's what's going on. Because like he is, he is came up with this world where he's like a, a working for an accountant firm kind of thing, and I'm trying to remember. It reminded me of if you've watched Inuyasha, it reminded me of when uh, Kagome got um, poisoned uh, with the Shikon, uh, yeah, with the Shikon Jewel, uh, what shell? Uh, yeah, with the fragment of the Shikon Jewel, and it reminded me of that a little bit, and when. Um, she had to figure out how to purify it, and it took a while for her to do that. That's what this rem this whole scene reminded me of. And let's see. And her and um instead of like having Kikio explain what was going on, it was uh Aaron's foster parents explaining it. And basically, what Lori said, you were more. Uh, Tom said. You've uh, created it all to escape the reality of your... Oh, before I got to say, Lori said this. Um, it means you're either going to die, live or, face, or or die, basically. And uh, Tom said, you've created it all to escape the reality of your current situation. And Lori said, you were mortally wounded in battle with the Dark Star who took the form of your father. And, the, and then the Angels of the Void got really interesting. So they vaguely recalled that they had once lived... Um, flashes of memory from a time and place when they had served another god. The memories filled the angels of the void with intense hatred, but also with the purpose to destroy those that have once been family to them. The black messengers could sense their former brothers and sisters somewhere, somewhere else, and it caused them great uh, pain. Jacket memories of their former selves assaulted their senses, making the desire to destroy, to kill, all the more urgent. And you need to find them and and you need to steal their lives so they that they too may receive the gift you were given that was that was the order that uh satan give that uh, gave them let's see oh then um Dusty before couldn't understand Gabriel, but ever since the sword burst with him, now he can understand Gabriel. And Dusty says this, So, I don't know how to explain it. Before, with the instrument, I was perpetually bombarded with sounds and visions of horrible things that were happening or would happen in the future. It was more than I could process. My brain couldn't handle all that information at once. Now I could still see it all, but it's not so overwhelming. I see all the possibilities. Kind of reminds me of Bach a little bit. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go read Bleach Manga. <laughs> um, now I can s still see it all, but it's not so overwhelming. I see all possibilities. There are so many choices, so many futures. Some decisions lead to victory, while others, uh, while others, yeah. And as I am now the sword, we have an advantage. Many decisions can lead us to victory, but there uh, um, are no guarantees of success. 
And then uh, something that else that I thought was really cool is that you know how Laura Lee was able to um, project into the other Nephilim uh, the, the visions that she was seeing in her mind to the other Nephilim? Dusty can do the same thing, but it's with shards of the sword, and he was able to do that into um, to Gabriel. And I know, and he says to Gabriel, "I know where we need to go." And he said, uh, uh, "Dusty said, and um, and now you do too." And now we're going to get to the contents of the box. So most of the box's co uh, contents appear to be old parchment paper, and they had an odd waxy feel and gave up an earthly aroma and he scanned the ancient writing somehow knowing that it was an angelic language and that he would be able to translate it god love that angel power uh let's see the ink had a reddish tint as a result of the passing years uh let's see um i'm trying to see if i can find it here it is so his father wrote um, of his time on earth, cut off from the heaven and cut off from heaven and his almighty God. But he also wrote of other things. He wrote of the architects. Whoever dreamed of who, who could even dream of, of stopping the architects? I've considered seeking out my other wayward brothers of heaven, but I know that they would not care. Many feeling disdain for Earth's native life that they um, that the Almighty would deem so um, Almighty deem so special. The architects' plans from what I've um, surmised go against everything the Lord God wants for this world. If only I might reach him, let him know of their treachery. But the Lord of gods won't listen to one such as me, one who feared the outcome of great of uh, the great war in heaven and fled in cowardice to live among humanity. Ah, so he's one of those! The Nephilim, the spawn of human and angel, who would have thought they'd be uh, the cornerstone of the architect's plans? Yet it, does, yet it does make sense. They meld two of God's most favored creatures, creatures of both heaven and earth. If the architect's plans carry through, these uh, beings will inherit the earth. So, then Ruchio, oh my god, then Ruchio has the goblins. Oh my god, that shit was funny. So, there, <laughs> a trade. Ruchiel announced, I give you this deserter in exchange for an audience with your commander, and if they had wanted mercy, then they should have done as he asked in the first place and allowed him to speak with their commander. And Ergo came to join him. Perhaps you'd, go, uh, you'd care to go inside to bring him out, Ruchiel suggested. And the goblin said this, replied, uh, perhaps you'd care to kiss my pup, uh, puppy rump. And he replied with a snarl, his anger at being turned over to his former comrades, obviously outweighed, um, outweighing his fear of the angel. And having no desire to drag the commander out, Ruchiel touched the edge of his burning sword to the entrance flap, setting it in place. And it didn't take long for the commander to emerge. Ah, there you are, Ruchiel said, as the goblin leader dropped to his knees before him. I wasn't sure if you'd heard me. This shit, this part, the re whole reason, of, reason why I'm reading this part is this shit was so funny. And the commander spit something um, thick and black onto the ground, a sign of disrespect. I serve the one one true lord, he, de he declared. I serve Satan the Dark Star with all my... And then Ruchiel sliced the commander's head from his body before he could finish. Wrong answer. And turning, Rachel addressed the remaining survivors with a slow, menacing flap of his wings. You serve me now. Any questions? I was like, I was like, Rachel. Oh my God, Rachel. That shit was great. I like Rachel is. I, I just. Oh my God. Oh my God, Rachel. Rachel is like totally Vegeta. I swear to God, Vegeta would have done the same thing. He totally would. He would have, but Vegeta would have blasted him. <laughs> It's all I would. Um, so Lori explained it, and now we're getting back to Aaron. So Lori said this, you ended up in this place for a reason. You escaped here to heal from, uh, you were struck down. Some of what you, uh, some of what hurt you was left behind. Kind of, and Tom added kind of like a poison in your system. And then Levi, so basically similar to what happened with Kagome and the Shikon Jewel, uh, and the uh, Poison Shikon Jewel that I mentioned to you. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch Inuyasha. You, you should be, well, should have watched Inuyasha anyway when you were growing up like I did. But anyway, so then we're getting, um, getting back to Levi because uh, this is kind of important anyway. So the architects have been here since the beginning of time as we know it, and they were the first of God's angels and have been manipulating world events to reflect what they perceive to be perfection. 
And then on the monsters, he says they believe that this is the road to perfection. We've been battling this crazy for quite some time. Architects are just fucking crazy. And we, the forgiven, see it as our purpose, our penance for the transgressions we committed against our Holy Father during the Great War. We are fallen, yes. And we finally understood the love that our uh, Lord God Almighty had for this world and swore to keep it from, safe from harm. They feel that God is mistaken. They believe this world um, has not yet reached its full potential, its zenith, and intend to guide it there. Uh, let's see. We were holding our own until the abomination of desolation so, uh, severed uh, the earth's connection to the divine. Though small and diminishing, the angel Adoriel managed to uh, maintain a connection, sending out a cry for um, for help to the power of heaven when the abomination threat, um, threatened. Let's see. Responding to the severity of the situation, heaven did send us a meaning for restoring the earth's connection to the divine. The child is a component of a powerful angelic being known as the Metatron, the ultimate divine en um, entity. So basically, Anosh was the answer to the unforgiven, as Virchiel was the response to um, Loralee. So, because remember, Loralee asked for help from God. Because originally, originally we all thought um, that God probably sent two things as a request from Loralee, which was Anosh and um, and Virchiel, but. It turns out it was just for Chiel was Loralee uh, was the answer to Loralee, and um, and Anosh was the answer to the Unforgiven. So there you go. Let's see. So what the Metatron is? It's got we if you don't remember, it's it is God, Angel, and Human, the um, culmination of all uh, the Creator's greatest achievements. And the Metatron was to be an extension of God on Earth, but the architects destroyed it. Yeah, you could thank uh, Malice and Tarshish for that. Uh, let's see. They slaughtered its humanity and dispersed the essence of God and, and the powers of angels. Basically, the baby is the human aspect of the Metatron. And with the Metatron whole, we finally have a way of restoring the ladder. And the ladder is a means by which Earth can again interact with Heaven. But without its reactivation, and the ladder, for those that don't know, they're, they're referring to Jacob's ladder. Um... But without its re reactivation, I fear that the world will be unable to hold on for very much longer. Let's see. And this is something interesting that's, uh, that Jan um, Janice is finding Cameron. And she says something interesting, because, and this is part of the effects of Wormwood uh, cutting off the world from heaven. Because we're wondering what happens to the people that have died so far. Janice says this, he, um, she, she said, I was so afraid while I was dead. I was all alone. Heaven never came. There was nothing, Cam, just a sad, cold oblivion. So basically all the souls of the people that have died are stuck in limbo. If you think about it, let's see. So something that happened uh, this is Gabriel and Dusty, uh, Dusty. And what Dusty does is he took some particles from the uh, sword and he uh, blew it, gently blew the particles from the sword into Melissa's face. And it just, and um, Melissa saw the vision. And Dusty concentrated on the possible future spread, uh, spread out in his mind and focused on the one with the best outcome. And he says this, with Melissa's help, Cameron will find the army, the army that will fight uh, in the final battle of Armageddon. And I see what you did there. See what you did there, Tom. And then Satan, uh, now we're getting back to Satan here. So Satan <laughs> says this, this is what I ask of you. This is how you will prove your fealty to me. You will find a way, and I think that this is what he says to the um, to the three sisters. Uh, you will uh, find a way to restore the passage to create a ladder that will allow me to ascend with my army to the gates of heaven. And this was called, this was bound to happen. This was mentioned a while ago, but anyway. So, let's see. So now we're getting a... 
mention about Enosh here. So Enosh was the um, amalgamation of all the Lord God was proud of, a mixture of supreme divinity, the angelic, and the human. He was the Metatron, the physical manifestation of the power and the glory of heaven on earth. And Enosh was, an, and Enosh remembered that there was a, pla a special place where the Metatron could communicate with his Holy Father, a place where heaven and earth touched, connected by the image of a ladder. Yeah, uh, basically, Enosh remember finally getting his memory back just randomly, and he started crying too as soon as he remembered who he was and what he had to do. But now uh, the sisters come in here, and this was crazy because I totally forgot that this happened too. So the sisters remembered how it had been, how the power came to be theirs. They had been the high uh, priestesses of the Mirtha tribe. Um, oh wait. Mirthra tribe, there we go, Mirthra tribe, an ancient people long forgotten to the mists of time. And the Mirthra uh, have been um, some of the first peoples of the planet, descendants of the world's first murderer, Cain. So you have Mirthra, the Mirthra people who are the descendants of Cain, which is pretty interesting. You wouldn't have thought about that. Um, Abel, uh, who killed his brother Abel, was sentenced by God to wander the world in punishment for his heinous act. They were the descendants of uh, Cain, and, it somehow, uh, and as if somehow marked by his murderous lineage, they were hated by the other tribes of the ancient world and forced to hide themselves or suffer the wrath of superstitious rabble. But the other tribes still knew of the Mir um, Mirthra and blamed them for any, of, for any Ill, fate and be um, Ill fate that befell them. And one of these tribes having, uh, let's see, had a particular dis, uh, dismal, um, dismal, God, why can't I fucking talk today? Uh, dismal hunting season and unfertile, and unfertile women decided that the reason for their misfortune was all due to the existence of the Mirthra. And the Mirthra, already um, hiding themselves away, became the hunted of these angry ancient people and met their fate at the tribe's, fate at the tribe's hands. And the sisters had prayed to their ancient deities and even to the ancient father, Cain, himself, but the gods were not listening, but something was. As the high priestesses lay in, um, in a cave, dying from wounds sustained in the genocidal attack on, the, on their tribesmen, the architects came to them, being, beings of equal parts, of, uh, parts lights, light and shadow. And I have to say, I, I'm curious what you, Nerdigan thought when, when, you heard, when you read Light and Shadow. Like, it, I wonder if you thought the same thing I did, that the architects, because of what they thought their purpose was, that they might have been tainted. Because that's what, because they're supposed to be mainly light. Anyway, the architects hung above them in uh, observation, like the stars of the, in the night sky. Uh, the priestesses had never seen their, their likes and believed that these beings, these new gods, would be the last sights they saw. And the architects stopped them from dying, freezing the moment of their pa um, passing from this world to the next with a question. If allowed to live, will you serve us? Go figure, right? So the, if it wasn't for the, the architects, they would be dead. I just thought it was interesting that they are des descendants of Cain, and it makes sense that they're working for the architects. But anyway. But, and the overseer asked them, what does the Stark Star ask of you? He wishes, and obviously they say, he wishes us to op uh, reopen the original passage to recreate the liar, the liar to heaven, so that he may lead an invasion. Uh, architects are not having, overseer's not having this. You will not do this. We have worked so hard to uh, severe the connection between the earth and heaven. We cannot risk the Lord seeing what we are doing before the world is ready. And the architects had such grand plans for the world of man and were desperate for um, the chance to show their creator how wrong he'd been. The architects were determined to uh, save a world that would have obliterated itself if allowed to proceed without intervention. They were so very excited to show him what they would achieve. But first, God, they're fucking stupid. The architects are just psycho, man. But anyway. Oh, now, oh, Malice and Tarsh, I love them. Pa uh, Tarsh has said, Patience, Malice, uh, you got a big date tonight or something? Big date, Malice repeated. Um, if only there, if, if only it was something so trivial. Oh, and this is uh, go, a flashback to when they killed the Metatron. And what remained of the Metatron lay curled in the fetal position. The body shell was huge, far larger than Malice even remembered. Or no, this wasn't a flashback. This is when um, they're getting the shell of the Metatron. 
Mouse followed and uh, together they entered the shell of the Metatron through an opening near where the stomach would be. The interior of the armor was illuminated by an eerily glowing moss that covered the, its surface. Let's see. It appears that the remains of div, uh, divinity has somehow affected some of the plant life. That's what Tarshish says. Uh, pointing out the... So, I wonder... Yeah, so basically the divinity affected the plant life, so it, it caused it to grow and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. But anyway. Um, oh, and then Loretta, who um, is one of the people that was with uh, Melissa in their group, and she died, sadly. Um, her soul left her body. And she even confirms that... Um, what I mentioned before, that all the souls are in limbo, uh, Loretta said this uh, when she saw Laura Lee. But, but this is really sad. Laura, uh, before I get to it, um, Laura Lee asked, can you see me? And the woman's mouth quivered and then went slack as, uh, as the life left her. And her husband brought her hand to his lips, kissing it lovely lovingly and then he laid his uh, head on her chest wrapped his arms around her and began to began to sob i thought that was so sad that was so sad because they were together for so long and oh never mind um uh you're here for a reason this is what loretta said i'm just waiting for you we're all waiting for you and before laura lee could question her the room was suddenly pulled away from them and replaced with another environment entirely and the two women now stood in an open area of nothingness but they weren't alone as far as the eye could see there were people men women and children of all sizes colors and shapes and what loretta explains is that they are the souls um who have passed since the world was cut off from heaven there our energies have nowhere to go we can't return to the source of all existence basically it, it's limbo they are stuck in limbo they can't go the souls can't go anywhere and because and for those that are like but what about hell well in this series there's no such thing as hell like i said this is like this kind of makes reminds me i i don't know if tom went the jewish route because well we believe Jews believe in angels and stuff like that, but we don't believe in a hell. Jews don't believe in hell, so that's why I'm thinking he went the Jew route in the in the religious department. But anyway, um, let's see. And meanwhile, Aaron is spontaneously combusting with holy fire, which was like, what the fuck is going on? And then the Sisters of Umbra backed away from uh, the mysterious stranger. So they they said, you, you know, want to know why I seem familiar? Uh, there's Tarshish. Oh, man, Tarshish. Is, I love Tarshish. Um, he says, you want to know why I seem familiar to you, ladies? I helped to place that power inside you. I, we killed the Metatron. We set God's power, which ended up in your possession, free. And the Sisters of Umbra attempted to... So, basically, God's power was in the Sisters of Umbra this entire time. And the Sisters of Umbra attempted to escape, but Tarshish would not have any of that. He's not having any of that. The Malachim's human form was gone now. Tendrils of humming divine energy reached out and snaring the three. The Sisters struggled in the Malachim's grasp, defending um, defenses of their own erupting from their ancient bodies. And suddenly, it was silent within the confines of the shell. So, basically... The, the sisters of Umbra are put in the divine shell now. They, they are not going anywhere. Let's see. Contain, yeah, uh, let's see. So, yeah, so, uh, Malice Rose, his eyes fixed on a sphere containing the power of God floating above the ground. What, um, where that, where, what remained of the sisters writh? Um, their bodies having somehow been fused together in a writhing mass of flesh and limbs, Mal uh, Malice held the spear in both hands, feeling the lingering presence of his friend. Tarshish, Tarshish had sacrificed his, himself to form a shell of supernatural energy that could contain the power of God for transport in order to recreate the Metatron. No! Tarshish is gone! Poor Tarshish! Oh, Tarshish will be missed, 
so much. Tychus is like the best character in this book. I swear to God. Now we get to Adoriel's uh, story. So, or uh, Adoriel says this. So these are the plains of um, Megiddo. So he gestured to an aerial image of the of a desert that the angel spirit had conjured for them. Humanity calls um, this region the Middle East, for this was where Beth El was built. You see, Beth El is the latter. Beth El was erected in the days of in the early days of humankind as this as the place where heaven and earth met. It was the prophet Jacob who gave it its other name, Jacob's Ladder. See, Jacob's Ladder. Uh, let's see. He was the third in line of patriarchs for Is uh, patriarchs of Israel on his uh, way down to the city of Haran to take a wife. At the end of his first uh, day of travel, he laid his hand, uh, his head down upon a stone in uh, the valley and slept. He dreamed that there was a ladder from earth reaching to heaven. He dreamed that the angels of God used it to ascend and descend. And that is Beth El after the fall of the Metatron, cold and lifeless, the direct path to heaven cut off by God when the Metatron ceased to be. And this is, he's t telling this to Loralee. It is only when the Metatron's power that it can be restored. And Loralee, you know, basically Loralee, will help return things to the way um, they have, they to the way they have always been. And the energies of the dead must return to the source of all life, to the stuff of creation. This, okay, I have to mention this with Cam this interaction with Cameron and Melissa, because this was fucking hilarious. So, um, Cameron says, um, after you, uh, and he just started to go in first, and then Melissa says, when did you become such a gentleman? And then Cameron says, when I realized that there might be booby traps. <laughs> and then Melissa says, jerk. I thought that was all funny. And then Lucifer and Aaron's head, he says, um, he says this, yeah, when you were stabbed, he, um, he, basically the Dark Star, planted a seed of darkness in your soul. It's growing. The darkness always leaves a piece of itself behind to fester and grow. And it's preventing you from healing. It's feeding on your courage, making you doubt who you are, what you are. You might have failed at some things here and there, but they're only minor pieces of the whole plan. Uh, the victor, victor of the battle is yet to be determined. Deep inside you is the strength of many. Oh... The creature uh, that possesses my flesh, Satan Darkstar, has certain plans for heaven. Plans that must be deterred. But before any of this can happen, you must leave this place. Basically, Malik, because uh, in his mind, Aaron was fighting Malik. That was part of the tri uh, part of the trial, and Aaron didn't want to do it. But Malik is representing this darkness that he has to fight. And oh my God, the feels when Aaron wakes up because. Uh, um, because Vilma's like, I need you, you need to wake up, and Aaron's like, I hear you, and I need you, too, I was like, oh my god, that's so sweet, and then we get the, to the, um, angel custodian, uh, and this is what he says to Melissa and Cam, because this is what they find. Um, it is the repository, the waiting place for the inheritors, of course, not people. They're like you. They're the inherit inheritors. The stasis pods are extremely delicate. They are all Nephilim. They, will, they who will inherit the earth. The architects have blessed your kind with their favor. Um, they have seen great potential in your species, and they have deemed you worthy of the future paradise. Uh, the powers, they were quite troublesome to the architect's plans, but that's where my legion came into the picture. When we realized what the powers were doing, the architects had us gather the inheritors. That, um, these were the cream of the crop, the strongest of the breeding program. And then, the, um, we find out the architects were making Nephilim. And, you know, it's all, part of it is the freaking Dark Star's fault. Because remember, the Dark Star's brainwashed, uh, Bruchiel and the powers to kill the Nephilim. Remember that. Uh, but anyway, how else were they to create the perfect beings to populate their new heaven? But the powers almost mucked it all up. They deemed the Nephilim's, uh, Nephilim abominations. Can you believe it? As if the perfect blend of the human and the divine could be such things. Uh, be such a thing. We had to work in secret. We snatched up the best of the children throughout the centuries. They were, um, there were many we couldn't save, many who died beneath the power sword, and others who took up arms against our holy mission. 
Well, no shit. Can you blame the Nephilim who took up again, took up arms against them? I don't blame them. Let's see. The uh. The decayed body, some the custodian admitted, but some all, some were also my brothers who were helping to fulfill the dreams of the architects, and they fought bravely against our foes. Why would they want to stop us? They, uh, why would they want to deny the birth of a new paradise, a new heaven? The old heaven had become tainted by war. Brother against brother. It was like poison, like poison um, coursed through the veins of a once perfect life. The Lord God had failed us. It was time for the architects to rebuild what had been lost. And humanity, and humanity has had its day. It failed. But it won't be forgotten, for its essence lives on in the Nephilim. I've been watching over my charges for a very long time, waiting for the day when the architects would tell me the, that the world was ready for the inheritors. I'm saying that there isn't much the architects haven't accounted for. Look at where, um, look where, ugh, look at where you are. Um, a mating pair of Nephilim in the nest of other mating pairs. The two of you will be better off in stasis. And once the architects deem this world is ready, and then the angel, of course, the angels of the world um, void showed up. The angels of the void showed up. And then the custodian released the an uh, angels from St Nephilim from stasis. And they look pissed. This is the army that, um, that Dusty, met, uh, Dusty saw. And here it goes. Here's Malice. He leaned his face in toward the cracking sphere. Uh, you can let it out now, Tarshish. The kid's here, ready and willing. And the halo that had once been um, the Malachim Tarshish gradually began to break down, and the divine energy that once belonged to the Almighty began to pulse and grow all the more intense as it was released from its confinement. And here we go. This is because Aaron's going to be become the Metatron. Metatron. You would think that. that you would think that the Unforgiven would have mentioned this shit about, um, the human. I didn't understand that. Like, why would you not mention that, Levi? Like, what the fuck? I was thinking that. I, I just was thinking about that. Like, really, Levi? Why would you not mention this? Because you mentioned earlier in the book to Velma that, um, God sent us a human for the Metatron. Like, why? Um, but here's what, because the, the power knows this shit. Power knows that Aaron's not the right vessel, but anyway. Uh, Aaron reached out for it to hold between his hands, but the powers would not have any of that, surging, in, uh, surging into his chest. It was like nothing he had ever experienced before. It was like dying and being born again, over and over. It was like having the sun placed inside you, so wonderful and warm but deadly hot. But you don't want to let it go, enduring the pain for as long as you possibly can, for to release it would be awful. The energy of God swirling around his soul before settling in for its stay. Uh, let's see. Um. And for now, a soundless explosion of sheer force um, emanated from his body, uh, in the way in which the force of heaven let them all know that it was staying. And let's see. Aaron watched as Malice's body was carried away by the silent emission, his now ancient skin and bones dissolving in the force of the blast, leaving nothing more, nothing behind to show that he had ever been there at all. No, Malice is gone! No, Malice is gone! Why did you have to kill off Tarshish and Malice? Why couldn't you let Aaron save them? Why? Ah! And as quickly as it started, uh, the sounds of the world returned, and Aaron found himself quickly turning around to see what the sudden release had wrought. Oh, and then Milton showed up! It, and Lucifer is like, and there's no other uh, that I would ha um, rather have by my side or on my shoulder. So should we see about getting this nasty business out of my way, out of the way? So, let's see. Oh, and then the Morning Star deliver, had then delivered a powerful kick to the door, shattering what he had created so very long long ago to contain the punishment um, meted out to him by the Lord God Almighty. And the barrier disintegrated before his onslaught, and Lucifer stumbled back as a blast of heat which stank of blood and despair assaulted him. In retaliation for his crimes against God in heaven, the Almighty had collected all the pain, horror, sadness, and misery that Lucifer had caused, um... One could call it, basically one could call it hell. 
And God had taken um, that hell and put it inside the morning star, a perpetual reminder of the crimes he had committed. Now Lucifer stood in hell as it swirled and screamed that, um, about him, reliving every moment of his loathsome sin against his creator and his creations. The turmoil bounced, uh, pounced heavily upon him, driving him to his knees, wanting him to relive the great... Um, great war it no longer phased him though for how long uh wait for how could he ever possibly forget uh he remembered what he had been responsible for every waking moment hell descended upon him uh again furious for all that time he had um been held prisoner power could such as this could be totally devastating especially in the wrong hands lucifer knew the ramifications of it being unleashed by satan dark star and it wasn't unnecessarily a bad change but it was a bad it was a change let's see where he had once been about five eight five eight and a half he was now more than six feet in his skin he wasn't wearing a shirt and his skin had taken uh on a kind of golden brown coloring his muscles um oh this is about uh is this yeah this is dusty now we're going to du back to dusty this is how the sword has changed him uh, let's see and he's and his skin he wasn't wearing a shirt and his skin had taken kind of a golden brown coloring and his muscles larger and more pronounced damn the pet or no that's aaron i'm sorry why did i say dusty no this is a a aaron and damn the pet da the power of god makes you freaking sexy why does the, the i don't blame the power of god for making you sexy that's just how it is man so dusty here's what's going on with the sword and dusty because remember the sword is basically merging with dusty so the pieces of the shattered sword were joining together in his body and dusty removed his sweatshirt in the flickering fluorescent light it looked as though he was wearing a gray metal chest plate only he hadn't put on armor any armor yet that um was what his chest had become what all of his flesh slowly uh, was slowly becoming and dusty said without looking back We've all got our part to play, and I've got a date with the future. If everything goes as I expect, it's going to get pretty damn interesting. Let's see. And Inosh, uh, and um, earlier on, I did I forgot to mention this. Inosh did get kidnapped by the architects. And Inosh awoke with a start, and he was encased in a transparent sphere of energy, a bubble of sorts that hung in the air above the great room where the architects had gathered. And, um... So what's going on in there is 12 architects stood around a ghostly interpretation of the world and visuals of what was happening across the world would suddenly pop up showing it some sort of event, but each quickly went away to be replaced by another and the events de um, depicted changed as quickly as the architects themselves. Let's see. And, um, let's see. So they transformed before Nasha's eyes, first appearing as rolling spheres, and this is the architects, uh, of fire covered in all-seeing eyes, and then morphing to a more human shape with multiple sets of gigantic wings growing from their back backs, and then to an enormously tall figure, um, to enormously then to enormously tall figures covered head to toe in robes that seemed to be cut from the fabric of the night sky, stars, and all. It was almost as if they couldn't make up their minds as they as to what they wanted to look like, deciding that they wanted to look like many things. And basically what they're saying, and they speak in people's heads. So, or so basically telepathically. And they're calling this, they call their, um, their realm of operations, they call it a habitat, which I thought was weird. And it says to prevent, and they said it's to prevent the pursuit of perfection from being interrupted. They're just fucking, the architects are just fucking psycho. And, um, let's see. And Aaron says this about Megiddo. Uh, Beneath the sands of the Israeli desert lie the remains of the ancient city of Megiddo. And, um, beneath, and Levy and said this. Well, and beneath that is obviously where Jacob's ladder is. And what Levi says is um, Megiddo, where it has been prophesied that the final battle between good and evil would occur. And this is actually consistent because this happened in, um, oh God, what series am I thinking of? The Angel Fire series by Courtney A. Moulton. This is where it happened. The final battle did happen in Megiddo. So there you go. 
uh, he is searching for Beth El, and the Dark Star is searching for the House of God, and their bot um, their bodies were. Oh, now we're going to uh, for the House of God. They have these guard their guards. So their bodies were lion like and large and powerful with human heads that stared at him. Kind of like sphinxes, actually. Um, but you know what they are actually called? But they have fiery wings, though. But and they're called um tri uh tribum. And I, it makes me wonder if that's how this well what the sphinxes were inspired by, if they were inspired by tribum or not. And um, they are the guardians of the house of God, and it was their job to keep him from uh, gaining entrance to his holy place. Basically, the dark star. And Laura Lee got Jeremy, finally. And she says, uh, we're between moments. In this place, the architects have created uh, have created it between moments in time, and between uh, the then and the now. Because Laura Lee and Jeremy are going are, um, to save the Nosh. And get him over to Bethel. Let's see. Um, do I want to mention this part? And this is the voice of um, Aaron as the voice of God said this. Hear me, citizens of the world. Let all who oppose the darkness come forth. And, he, and, all the, and from his mouth, all the languages of um, spoken to the planet. Yeah, hear me, citizens of the world. Let all who oppose the darkness come forth. Climb out of, from your hiding place and take back what has been stolen from you. Join against, uh, join the fight against the evil that has come, has grown like cancer across the land. Drive back the darkness from whence, hence, it, whence it came and take light into your heart. And the voice of God inside his head, uh, and Virgil could barely contain his joy. How long it had been since he had heard the. Um, dulcet tones of the creator's voice and the message was a call to arms against the for, uh, forces of darkness and then here's what I thought was interesting the overseer absorbed so the overseer remember there's only one architect left because I remember when I was reading this I was like how are there 12 because I thought there was only one left well the overseer is able to duplicate himself so there's that and he Absorb the other architects, and they have, and they came merged back with his body. And he said, "Whoever said they had a choice? I've merely taken back what was mine to begin with. They were all aspects of me, as I was an aspect of God. I am much more than that. I was um, when I was first created. And once I've and yeah, let's see. I'm trying to see what else is here. And Lucy and Dusty is now fully at this point now, Dusty's fully merged with the sword and he's got he heard the voice of God. He's heading over to Megiddo. Lucifer has just foiled Darkstar's plan, uh, uh, fucked things up, and uh, is going to be controlling shit, because uh, he, he controlled hell. Um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, I've got to mention this. So... There, there was a paint. The painting was of him because he saw the vi saw the vision again, and uh, the likeness not all that flattering, but it was obvious who the crude interpretation was supposed to represent. In his arms, amid turmoil and file, uh, fire, Bachiel held a, held a child. The child, more than likely, is a nosh. And a choice not yet made, the prophet repeated, as the paintings faded, replaced by the stark white walls of the chamber. No, a choice made, Bachiel said certainly. And let's see. I'm trying to see what else here. For the first time in so very long, his mission was clear. A sword of fire came to life with the power of his thought, and he wrenched his 
his shoulder from the angel's powerful grip, and he raised the sword of fire above his head as his wings carried him up, and with all his might he drove the sword into the sphere that contained the child, and there was a blinding, deafening release of force as the bubble exploded, but above the din he heard an angelic being's voice dripping with supreme disappointment. Yep! That's what the choice was. It was the choice of saving Inosh or not. And Laura, I loved it. Laura Lee is firing key blasts at the architect, and um, and then she tried to pull away. But something that's interesting about the architect is that he has he could pull control souls. So yeah, and Adoriel and the others tr slowly drifted away from her too, and uh, Laura Lee could feel her soul's energy growing weaker and less defined. Uh, as the architect's grip strengthened on her on her on her arm, and she suddenly grew became painfully aware that it was only a matter of minutes before her essence would blow away like smoke from an extinguished match. Oh, I thought this was so cool! Then you had the Israeli uh, Air Force coming in, and the fighter jets were firing missiles at dragons. I thought that was so cool. God's um. Some of humanity had answered God's call, warriors and civilians emerging from their places of safety to fight for earth, heaven, and God. No shit, I am not surprised that the Israeli Air Force was coming in to fight. No shit, dude. It's, the Israeli military will come in and fight. And then, and then Lucifer and Taylor's reunion. Oh my God, that was so cute. I was just like the feels. Oh my god, he could not help himself. He brought his mouth to hers, and his kiss was eagerly accepted, and it renewed his strength to bow the ancient force that possessed him. Oh! It's so good! And Aaron said this, I, what I, um, I tried to assume the mantle of the Metatron, but I don't think the power of God likes me. And then Anash says, the extreme power was not meant for you. No shit! It's fighting you, eating you alive from within. And Lucifer said to Taylor, oh my god, the feels. He, she said, he said to her, I never believed that I would ever get the chance to say how sorry I am. Leaving you was one of the hardest thing I, things I've ever done. And she placed the most tender kisses upon his lips. And Lucifer thought that if he were to die right then, he would be satisfied. And Dusty brought um, Anosh to the scene. I think it can help, the child said, leaning in close. Looking into Aaron's eyes, the power that's killing you belongs to me. Oh, no, that was uh, Dusty um, that said that extreme power was not meant for you. That's what it, what it was. Anyway. Or, I'm sorry, Lucifer said that. No shit. Um, sorry. <laughs> I totally screwed it up. But anyway. Um, and then the ancient uh, evil, the Dark Star, w uh, was wailing inside Lucifer. He's like, and then Lucifer's like, scream all you want, uh, scream all you like, lo uh, loathsome thing. You are my prisoner now. Karma's a bitch! This just made the evil fight all the harder, but Lucifer endured, using the love that he experienced in, in seeing Taylor Corbett again as a source of inspiration. Suck on that, Satan! Um, let's see. Um... Oh, and then, um, and then Milton, yay, he, he said, hello, Milton, uh, Lucifer said to the mouse, I'm afraid we're going to need to let it out, and his friend, uh, little friend, uh, obediently scampered away from the door as the chains began to disintegrate, and large metal links, uh, failing, wait, falling to the, do uh, floor of Lucifer's subconsciousness, and what are you doing, the evil demanded? Attempting to inflict all manner of psychic pain upon him, but it was nothing in comparison to what Lucifer felt about at, felt at what he was about to do. I'm taking care of you for good. Yeah, you wouldn't. Yes, you would. Yeah, he opened hell because Lucifer is able to control hell now. And what what he did was this. The strange about so Lucifer surged up from the great mount of beasts that tried to claim him, and um, the force his body 
emitted, tossing them miles, reducing their bones to paste. And the monster legions feared him again and fled his wrath, but he would not let them go far. And Lucifer took to, air, took to the air one, uh, once more, and the power of hell radiating from his body. He let the dreadfulness uh, flow from his being like some awful pheromone. And the monster stopped running and gazed up at him, like bees attracted to the scent of pollen. The nightmares were drawn to the desolation he exuded. And Satan cowered at, yeah, Satan cowered at Hell's Fury. This is now in Lucifer's control, and the ancient evil attempted to retreat deep in the morning stars of consciousness, but Lucifer is not allowing that shit. And you'll stay right here with me, where I can keep an eye on you. He's no match for it. And Lucifer said to the legions of monsters, come to me. I am your lord and master, and this is how Hell was born. And he said, this world is not uh, not a place for the likes of you. And here's a, a place more uh, better suited for you. And the throng uh, responded um, after he opened the ground, basically. down to the, That's it. Down to the hole we go. And a hell of our own um, making, a hell of our own making awaits us. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Do I want to mention this? Yeah, the Metatron was obviously reborn. If it wasn't for Dusty, um, he would have been fucked. Anosh would have been totally fucked. <laughs> and he recognized that. Oh, and then, he, I love the Goblin. So, this scene was hilarious. But, um, hold on a second. I gotta mention this. So, Anosh, this is what he says on Dusty. So, um... Oh, yeah, and the Architect's headquarters, before I forget, they were brought down by the recent dead, which was pretty sick. Uh, but Anosh said about Dusty, do you think I'm uh, privy to everything, dog? He's been changed, transformed. The Gab Gabriel has. Or, and Dusty has, too. Or I should say Dusty, excuse me. If you will, into an instrument of God. And it's a good thing, too, for I would have likely been killed when the Architect's base went down if it wasn't for him. And then Anosh, this is how uh, they... How, Anosh has described, a striking figure clad in armor that looked as, as if it was created from the stuff of stars stood at least 20 feet high. Its face was hidden by a featureless he um, helmet, but its eyes burned with the supreme intelligence. The Metatron was reborn. Now this part I thought was fucking hilarious, so I gotta, I gotta read this part because I, I just was laughing. So a goblin clutching a knife and what appeared to be some of um, some other beast's scalp turned and approached them. A spoil of war, my master, and the goblin bowed before Virgil, Virgil pre um, presenting his bloody gift. My master, Jeremy exclaimed, looking from Virgil to the monsters that stood among those they had vanquished, and they were all bowing their misshapen heads to Virgil. They follow you? He asked incredulously. And Virgil smiled, accepting the tribute. They do, he said, holding the scalp close to his face, rubbing the coarse black hair between his thumb and finger. And what, pray tell, do you plan to do with them? Jeremy asked. Um, do with them, Virgil asked, um, uh, letting the scalp fall to the crown as, um, as he raised his fiery sword. Isn't it obvious enough one might tend to lead them into battle? I thought that was so funny. Um, let's see. So, we find out, actually, that the Overseer was planning to have Vilma and Jeremy as a mated pair, which was freaking crazy. Like, what the fuck? Like, the architect showed this to her brain that she's supposed to be with, 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 um, with Jeremy. It's like, what the fuck? Fuck. Screw you, architects. But anyway, the instrument's metal form began to change any semblance to the human body quickly disappearing. And over the centuries, the instrument had been many things. A trumpet to call down the end of days. A sword so sharp it could, uh, severe the ties um, between heaven and earth, and now it took on its newest shape and purpose, a key. A key to unlock the passage between the world of man and God. A key to unleash this planet's unlimited potential. It was time. Which was pretty freaking sick. Um, let's see.
And yes, now the connection's back. And now Aaron's talking to God. And God possessed Gabriel. Go figure, right? Because <laughs> Aaron's like, I'd like to know who's possessing my dog and who I'm talking to. And God's like, it, it's God, basically. And he's like, let's just say I'm someone who's been watching you for a long time. And I owe you quite a bit of thanks. You, you've helped save the world that I love very much. Save, to save a world I, I love very much. And you're, Aaron's like, you're God. If that's what you wish to know me as, I uh, answer to many names. And Aaron's like, why are you talking to me through my dog? And God said, I've um, always had a special fondness for canines. Or didn't you notice what dogs, um, didn't, or didn't you notice what dog spelled backwards is? When you changed, Gabe, uh, changed Gabriel, you made him the perfect receptacle for my spirit, the perfect host for me to use in delivering my message to you. I want to thank you for what you and your brothers and sisters have done for this world. And Aaron says, why did you let me let so much horrible stuff happen? But let me go back to what God said about that. So, and I love when, Arthur, when authors do this, when they tie shit that happens from the very beginning to now, because it makes sense. And then God says, cut right to the chase. Good for you. And Aaron says, you're God. You're supposed to be loving and kind and look out for the good people. Um, Aaron turned back to his dog, holding his gaze with an icy intensity. But a lot of good people have died. And God's like, uh, God sighed. And for that, I'm sorry. But, but there was no other way. So all Aaron, and I don't blame Aaron for being pissed. So all those innocent people, my foster parents, the other Nephilim, Janice, Kirk, William, Russell, and Samantha, and Loralee, they were all part of some bigger plan? Well, Loralee, I, you know, Loralee was part of a bigger plan. If you think about it, she was. But Janice, Kirk, William, and Russell, and Samantha, yeah, they were not part of a bigger plan. They just weren't, in a sense they weren't, but in a sense they were, because if it wasn't for them attacking uh, Cameron... Uh, Melissa wouldn't have met up with Cameron and got the army. So there's that. Um, and God said they uh, they were, which, which he's actually kind of right if you think about it. And Aaron says, so they were all just some sort of collateral damage. And, um, and then God nodded. And, well, Gabriel's head nodded, but it was God. And Aaron says, what kind of loving God are you? A loving God that does not, does not interfere with the lives of his creations. Even though angels and devils and all kinds of other crazies were taking shots at us? Next you'll be telling me that this was all some sort of test. And God said, um, I had to be uh, certain that you and your world were ready. Um, ready for what comes next. Humanity has always been my favorite creation. Despite their obvious failures, their arrogance, their indifference toward their fellow man, and their pension... Um, Penchant for violence, humanity has the capability to rise above their imperfections. I've seen that capability in you and other Nephilim, Aaron Corbett. The Nephilim are what humanity strives to be. The perf um, perfect combination of human and, divi and divine. Evolution takes many surprising shapes, uh, God said. Sometimes perfection isn't quite so obvious. And then, of course, um, there's the matter of jealousy. It's time for this world to be paradise. I didn't object to what the architects were trying to do. It was how they were going about it. All that darkness, it never should have been allowed to get so out of hand. Aaron said, but it did, and you let it. And God answered, you're right, because that is how you and your brother's sister and sisters, brothers and sisters came um, into your own. And then Aaron says, I don't like where, really don't like, he's getting pissed. I really don't like where any of this is going. And what's that old saying? To make an omelet, you must break a few eggs. And this is what God says. Eggs? And Aaron's getting pissed. Is that how we are to you? And, the, and uh, God says, you people, humanity. Most of the time you have me so wrong. I don't want to be an object of absolute reverence or someone to be feared. I'm your creator. I love you all and I just want you to be good to one another. And when we're not, that's when evil happens. That's when events spiral out of control. And I look down upon the world, um, wanting to intervene, knowing that I shouldn't. But but you did. You sent the child. You sent Enosh. The architects have, and then God says, the architects have been a problem for some time. And I've been carefully planting the seeds to fix it. Enosh was that last seed. 
there. It's like, you say you don't like getting involved, but, but, and God says, but sometimes in order for things to be the way they have to be, I do. And are they, and this is what Aaron says, and are they, are things the way they need to be? And God says, we're getting there. We're getting there. And then Melissa and Cameron, and they got the other Neville forces together and they go to destroy the architect, architects, or I should say architect. And the architect said, um, or the overseer says, if only um, you knew the glories I had planned for you, but that's all over now. It's time that I take it all back, you ungrateful wretches. God. Uh, let's see. Oh, Mama Taylor was awesome. She like she took one of the Unforgiven's uh, wings and she just and uh, sh the razor sharp feathers and buried them deep within the upper body of the architect with a satisfying thunk. Oh, damn, that was freaking awesome. Uh, let's see. Uh, do I want to mention this? And Lorelei made it to heaven, but I should mention before I mention that. Um, I feel so you you know I feel bad for the architect. He had the same problem that if you think about it that Lucifer had. Because let's see. Because he's thinking like as he's dying he's thinking. Do I really want to be loved and worship as God? In a way, he did, for he knew that if I, given the chance, he could sh he could show his Creator the error of his ways, and then the Architect would reign over heaven and earth and the universe beyond, and and God would be wished away as the Overseer had once been. God would be finished with his tasks, and the Architect would build a new reality. That was what the Overseer had always envisioned. Instead, he had only anger and sadness, emotions strong enough to fuel what he would do next. And the architect knew that once he was brought before God, he would be eliminated. And that concept filled him with yet another emotion, fear. Fear of ceasing to be and fear of having everything he had worked toward a race, uh, toward a race by disapproving godly hand. And then that fear and sadness were consumed by anger. And the architect knew what he would do if the Lord God was going to ignore his efforts, dismiss his achievements as nothing more than mistakes, then he would make it easier for the creator. The architect would wipe the slate clean. He would make the earth a blank canvas again, and the divine power that he had stolen, built to make um, critical mass uh, within the architect's protective sphere, it, it, yeah, within, it will all be over soon. He wanted to tell the creatures that pummeled his shield with their pitiful weapons and what little remained of their own heavenly energies, they um, the world wiped clean in the bl blink of an eye. And the architect tr uh, tried to fight as pieces of his protective shield fight, uh, fell away. Tendrils of energy leaped from his outstretched hands to wrap about the golden armor giant, but his, his efforts had uh, little effect. And damn, the, ar the architect, like... I feel bad for him, but at the same time, he is just freaking, you would think that the architect is like supposed to be a heavenly being, but this is, this proves the point that creatures of light are not always, um, are not always good, but uh, let's see, and, um, the Metatron returned, uh, the architect to, to God. And he was absorbed into the Metatron. And he returned to the power that, that I had created him, which is freaking cool. And then, yes, Laura Lee went to heaven and she was reunited with Lahash. And he said, you've done good. Uh, let's see. And Laura, actually, Laura Lee is not going to heaven right now. Um, she's going to catch up with Lahash, which I thought was cute. And, oh, we saw Camille, and, um, Ruggiel dropped to, um, one knee, one knee, and his head bowed in reverence, um, 
and respect to the one who had once led the angelic host powers. Forgive my insolence, um, he said, slow, uh, He said, but I cannot allow these creatures to be harmed. And Camille says, you would defend these creatures against your own kind? I would. And then Camille says, you do me proud. It's gratifying to see that you have learned from your past mistakes. You now see the potential for good in all life forms, no matter their place of origin. Welcome back, my brother. You've been gone too long. Oh! And then the Metatron says this. He says, hear me, sons of daughters of Earth, for I am the voice of God. Um, let's see. Trying to see if there's anything else here. I'm really sorry that this video is really long, but there's a lot of stuff here that I want to cover. So now let's get this is one year after the, now we're getting to the epilogue. Or right before the ep epilogue. The Nephilim uh, are um, now the guardian, they're going to be the guardians to the new world, and they're missionaries of um, uh, God's light and scourges of shadow, basically. And it was their world to watch over and protect from harm. And Nephilim, uh, that basically, and they would do anything and everything to keep it safe. So now uh, get to the epilogue, which is one year after God's message to the world. And uh, let's see. And they have, so basically Aaron um, and uh, the rest of the Nephilim have a control uh, at their control center, have like the, have the earth, and it um have like this ghostly uh, sim simul uh, simulacron of the earth slowly spinning. And it, if there were any dangers that required the attention of, of the Nephilim, a circle of red would have pulsed with the location. And at the moment, it's quiet. There's not so much darkness. And, and darkness would no longer have a place on earth. The Nephilim were there to ensure that. So basically, this is what's changed in a year. So, um... Uh, they had come to the installation in droves, men, women, and children, the young and the old, people eager to help achieve God's vision for the world. For many, the world has lived too long in the shadow of darkness, and they welcome the Nephilim's efforts. Others, well, some did not care to see one group endowed with so much power, but they were slowly coming around. Um, let's see. And it's that, um, the control room... How Aaron likes to see it is it's a representation of the world. All people, Nephilim, humans, and even members of the monstrous community, thanks to Virchiel, working together toward a common goal. Let's see. And the Unforgiven, too. The Unforgiven are there. Let's see. With their mission accomplished, the Unforgiven angels have been given the choice of returning to heaven, purged of their sins, and returned to their glory, or staying on earth. Most have returned to, most have chosen to return, but several embraced a new mission. Um, let's see. And, yes, for Chiel is a commander. And, uh, let's see. And even though the darkness had been burned from the world by the light of heaven, evil still managed to hide in the shadows, waiting for an opportunity to uh, to flourish. Let's see. And the demons were just one of the newer threats to the world since the Almighty decreed it part of heaven. And it was um, as if the ancient species, which possessed the flesh of the living, twisted it into a monstrous mockery, had been wait patiently waiting to emerge, waiting for heaven to be closer. And... Um, and for Chiel, actually, it said here, it says in the book, for Chiel felt a surge of excitement. This is why, this was why he had been given a second chance. This is what the Lord God Almighty had really wanted him to do. And this time there would be no distractions. And just like the Malachim said, Bill and Aaron are married. And after uh, Heaven's declaration, the Nephilim, uh, Nephilim yeah, had declared that the site of the last battle, um, Armageddon, would be their home. And the land had been given to them by the Israeli people. And the, oh, go Israeli people! Um, and the land had been given, uh, let's see, and the materials, uh, they gave, even gave them the materials they needed to construct their new homes, donated by all the nations of the world, and going as far as to incorporate the ancient city of Megiddo into its design, um, signifying their God, uh, their and God's uh, vision. And Airy too quickly sprang up from the desert, bringing hope to changing the world, a changing world. And then Heritage said it adjusted quite well to 
um, modern times and roles they now play and they now play. And Taylor left and she went to go be with Lucifer, which I thought was adorable. And Aaron and Vilma had twins just like Gabriel said. And this is something interesting. And he also said, and uh, something that Aaron noticed is that he could already see tiny feathered wings growing from beneath the shoulder blades. And something Levi says is the normal gestation pe uh, period for a human child is nine months. But these are not human children. These are Nephilim children. And these children will grow at a far more rapid pace. And they should be ready for birth within the next 90 days, give or take. And... And they'll be the most special children in the world. They'll be magnificent. Ah! God, I love it. Oh, man. And this is, I love how this story, this ends. And Jeremy Fox was going to stop Taylor, but, you know, he just let her go. And I love how this ends right here. It was, it was so great. His creator believed that he was truly sorry for his crimes and that he would continue to make penance until he was fully forgiven. And Lucifer kissed Taylor Corvette and felt his inner strength grow. And the darkness that threatened to overtake him stamped down so deeply that he could barely feel its presence. Love was the way that his God acknowledged one, such as he, guilty of all crimes, worthy of some compassion, a, sh a show of sympathy, sympathy for the devil. I love this series. This series is my favorite angel series. And the hashtag angel readathon. I'm sorry this video is so long, Nerdigans. This was, uh, it's because there's just so much stuff in this vid in this book that is going to be coming back in this, in, in my ranting that I'm going to be doing soon. But anyway, what did you think of this series and what was your favorite book in this series? Uh, there was so much I loved in Armageddon and I, oh, it's hard for me to pick a favorite in this series. And Tom, I'm freaking sorry that it took so long for me to make this. But anyway, remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Nerdigan Zinc. And if you want to help um, with the Nerdigan Zinc um, expansion, there's a couple things you could do. You could either donate to my Patreon or um, or donate something uh, off of my uh, Nerdigan Zinc wish list, Amazon wish list, which is in the description box below. If you see something that's not on the Amazon Nerd, uh, Nerdigan. <laughs> On the Nerdigans Inc. Amazon wish list, if there's something else you want to donate on there that you want me to add, please let me know either on the Twits, which is Twitter, or in the comment section below, and I will definitely, or in or YouTube's message, and I will definitely do add that. But anyway, until next time, Nerdigans, I will be seeing you in the next book Nerdigan discussion video, which will be Halo by Alexandra Aldonado. Until next time, Nerdigans, bye!